we are together going to be going through this book influenced by Robert Caldini, which is presumably if you're getting into copywriting, this should have been sitting on your nightstand for the past however long you've been thinking about getting into copywriting and you've just never really had the opportunity to dive into it. I wanted to start like exploring and providing content for one other thing that I'm doing, which is that I have a morning talk show with a couple of friends of mine. It's called The Copy That Show. That's on twitch.tv slash The Copy That Show. You can also find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash copy that. And I wanted to start making additional bonus content for that Patreon. And we'll get into the ethics and techniques of providing free content later on. But a lot of what I wanted to do here is give everybody the opportunity to see this for free so that they don't feel obligated to have to like sign up to uh, the Patreon that we have set up for the copywriting materials that we are creating. So that's me. Let's talk about influence and what we're going to do today. Today, I am going to go through just a brief summary of both chapters and this book and why we're talking about this to begin with. And we're going to drill into some of the specific takeaways that Caldini provides, as well as some of the specific examples he provides that show why these techniques are useful to know as a marketer, as a copywriter, as a salesperson, as a content writer, as a writer in general, as a salesperson, as pretty much anything in life that involves persuasion and influence, because it really doesn't matter what kind of copywriting or persuasion or marketing you do, it really is influence at its root and at its base. You know, even if you were trying to write a compelling argument that shows why a beauty cream is good to use, you're still trying to influence somebody to hold that opinion by the end of whatever you're writing, even if you're not selling something. So influence really is, and persuasion really is at the root of, everything that we do when it comes to marketing. There's a difference between the principles of persuasion, the strategies of persuasion, and the tactics of persuasion. And let me explain what that means. The principles of persuasion are innate and unchanging. They are things that are innate to either human culture or the human brain, things that everybody does more or less the same because that's just a part of human nature. I see that there are 31 attendees. I just wanted to say that I am grateful for everybody that decided to come today. And I hope that you get a lot out of this. Anyway, thank you for joining me on a lovely Sunday afternoon. Let's talk about chapter one, the levers of influence. Chapter one, uh, each principle is a detectable and ready lever, a lever of automatic influence. The whole point of this chapter is to one, captivate you with some Interesting counterintuitive stories. For example, it opens up with the turquoise jewelry maker who said, because I want to move this jewelry, I'm going to cut it the price in half. But then people misread her writing and said, oh, it's actually double. So one of the things that people are immediately supposed to take away from this book is like, oh, there's going to be a whole litany of different tactics and techniques that I can use for my own marketing and my own sales. And that's partially true. But it's interesting because this book is trying to establish a few premises, but it's also very conflicted in what it's trying to accomplish. It opens up with this notion that humans behave essentially programmatically. And you see that when he's talking about, oh, it is almost as if the animals, the patterns we were installed as programs within the animals being observed. So he's taking a lot of animal studies about behavior and saying, well, humans are the same. But what's interesting about that is that he doesn't really provide any proof of that. He just says it. I hope you guys noticed that because a lot of the premises of this book are based upon a realm of psychology called behaviorism, which was established and really sort of popularized by B.F. Skinner. And that whole realm of psychology is built off the notion that humans are l largely like animals. They don't really have a whole lot of free will. They operate mostly programmatically. They tend to do what they are hard-coded 
and programmed to do. But one of the arguments against this is, well, what if there is free will? What if humans can deny operand conditioning? And this actually, I think, is an important discussion that every marketer and copywriter needs to have, because we're going to start talking about these underlying universal principles. One thing that I want you to keep in mind as we're talking about this is that when we talk about universals, nothing is universal. Like you only need one person who doesn't respond normally to these things for it not to be universal anymore. And I actually had a, um, a drunken argument with a pretty famous copywriting guru and YouTuber. He was saying that these principles of copywriting, the notion of making something seem new or easy or safe or big, were universal, were just like baked into the, the human consciousness. And my simple argument against this notion of humans behaving programmatically is that, well, if that were the case, why aren't we seeing 100% conversion rates? when we try to sell something. Obviously, there's more going on. Even if there are principles underlying persuasion and influence, there are other things built on top of that too. There are walls, barriers, observations. If everybody's aware of a tactic, of a strategy, well, then you might start to question the principle. But in reality, it's just the awareness of the tactic or awareness of the strategy you know, that it becomes saturated, that it no longer works as well because of how commonly it's used and how aware people are. On the subreddit, if anybody, and I mean anybody, tries to say that something valuable is being given away for free, immediately in the comments, somebody is going to come in with either a downvote or a, oh, you shyster, you're, this is obviously just an attempt to get you into the funnel. Obviously, that strategy of like the free webinar that leads to a sale or the you know, free gift that is trying to compel you to spend more at Starbucks. You know, these are all things that as we become more and more aware of them, become less and less effective. And so while the principle is still there, the strategies need to be either evolved and the tactics need to be changed. That's something to keep in mind as we're reading. I'm just going to read these two, this other quote that I have here. We too have our preset programs, and although they usually work to our advantage, the trigger features that activate them can dupe us into running the right programs at the wrong times. And that, that kind of takes me to uh, the second thing that I think Caldini is trying to do with this book, specifically the conflicted message that I think he's sending with this book. On one hand, he's trying to identify the levers of influence, the principles of persuasion, so that he can, quote, defend ourselves against them, so that we can all sort of have this wall, this criticality that allows us to avoid being harmed by these automatic programmatic responses. I think that's great. That's super. That's stupendous, especially when we talk about reciprocity, the notion of like having women be aware that it's a common tactic to buy a woman a drink because they're trying to leverage off of reciprocity. Everybody is aware of that. I'm pretty sure that the conversion rate on that has probably declined a little bit, but there is a benefit in knowing about these tactics if you want to preserve the self or fulfill any of your own personal desires devoid of any other, other person's influence. I think that's very altruistic. That's great. That's a good goal for this book. But on the other hand, this book, since it came out, has become sort of like a Bible for marketers. One of the reasons why we're talking about this book is because we can use these principles to improve our copy, improve our marketing. Caldini is also very open and very transparent about the fact that he's also using these techniques to sell his books. I don't know if you recall, but in chapter two, there's an entire like insert like, oh, well, if you went to my website, you could have gotten a free gift of the first chapter of Presuasion, my newest book. The goals of, you know, those reciprocal, those free gifts is to one, give people, allow people to make a rational, informed decision, but also to have that psychological, here, here's a gift. You owe me something right back. He's aware that he's using these techniques that he says he's trying to teach you to defend against. So there's an internal conflict there at the heart of this book. I don't want to use this platform to talk about the ethics of marketing because I think that everybody needs to make their own choices in that regard. And I am not your daddy, unless you subscribe to my newsletter, Finance Daddy at DIYWealth.com. It's totally free. <laughs> he kind of undermines like what he's saying he's trying to do. And in that, 
if you guys are fans of the band Blur, Modern Life is Rubbish. This notion that, you know, this book is important because modern life, especially with the internet, has made things so complicated and has made certain distractions so intrusive and emotionally arousing and has just worn away at our executive faculties and has created so much decision fatigue that we're in, quote, no cognitive condition to operate mindfully when it comes to these persuasive or influence tactics or techniques. If you're a marketer, you're probably not going to be taking away like, oh, here's how I will never be able to be sold something. You're probably going to be looking at this book more from the like, okay, here's how I can use reciprocation so that I can sell more for myself or for my clients. I review a lot of junior copywriting. There's very little attention paid to the reasons behind things or the logical explanation behind things. And you don't really even need an elaborate response in order to trigger somebody's desire to respond in a way that is conducive to what you're trying to get them to do. It's easy to influence somebody if you say, I want this because of this. The way Caldina puts it is the word because can trigger an automatic compliance response. That's important for your marketing because in a lot of junior and newbie copywriting, there's just no attention paid to reasons. Like, why should you pay attention to this? Why should you buy this? What, like, why? But one interesting finding from that study, if you guys read the book, you know what I'm about to say, is that the reason doesn't even need to be particularly good as long as you were using because, due to, since, that line of logic. It's not the actual logic that's persuasive to people. It's that program, according to Caldini, that's running the moment they hear a reason. And it can be any reason that you plug into that. It just has to be there. I think. Caldini does a bad job of dividing those universal principles, those culturally based, the success-based strategies, and those sort of ephemeral, like short-lasting tactics. One of the things that you need to keep in mind when it comes to pricing is that pricing is not inherent to human nature. When we were all monkeys, like we weren't going like, oh, coconut, five seashells or whatever. The notion of money and value and intrinsic value being associated with money is a relatively recent phenomenon, a few thousand years. One of the things to understand about this is that it's very culturally based. But one thing to keep in mind is that there are principles at work and there's strategies of increasing price to labor off of those strategies. And human perception tends to view something with a higher intrinsic value is being worth more. And however we abstract that value, in this case with money, that becomes a stand-in for the intrinsic value of something. So here's the quote from that particular takeaway. Price alone had become a trigger feature for quality and a dramatic increase in price alone had led to a dramatic increase in sales among the quality hungry buyers. Now, one of the things that you sort of need to keep in mind is that he doesn't really talk about this much, but like, there are, yes, people who associate quality with a high dollar value, but there's also bargain hunters in the world, people who only shop if it's from a thrift store or on a clearance rack or things like that. And he doesn't really talk about those people very much. He leaves it at expensive equals good, inexpensive equals bad, and that's it. He just says that that's the principle here at work. There are some problems with that, but it still works more or less for enough people that it's valuable. So one thing to keep in mind here, and here I'm deviating from Caldini, is that the value of your products, especially if you're trying to sell something, it's very barbell shaped. You can get a lot of value from opting for premium buyers. You can get a lot of value from opting for bargain buyers, but the space between is a no man's land. You are almost certain to fail if you are just trying to strike that middle ground. If you're trying to be the middle of the road, third out of five when it comes to pricing for a particular service or product or anything. That's important to keep in mind for your clients. You either want to go really low and undercut your competition, or you want to go way higher and ask people to spend more than your competition. You know, this is why I mean, aside from the economics of it, you see courses on copywriting for like $497. Obviously, if it's going to be worth that much, the information inside 
must be really good, right? That's what's going on here. Expensive equals good. If you see something that's fundamentally working, like in your mind, if you see something expensive and then you see a cheaper thing, the cheaper thing is going to seem way cheaper in comparison to the first thing. If you see something cheap and then something expensive, the expensive thing is going to seem way more expensive than the first thing that they saw. It's all about the order in which somebody sees something. We will talk about this when we talk about reciprocation, but if you are arranging a set of numbers, like for example, if you're trying to show proof that stock gains are really good based on a particular kind of investing strategy, start small and then get bigger and bigger and bigger over the course of whatever sales message you're trying to make. Because by comparison, those gains are going to feel much, much bigger. It also works the other way around. If you start big and then go small, people are going to be less receptive to it because they're like, okay, well, that seems really like weak fish. I don't like that. It has to do with pricing as well. Like if you are trying to sell a piece of jewelry, and he talks about this in the book, show the expensive like thing that you don't like wa actually want to sell first, and then show the price point that you do actually want to sell at. Even if it's like average middle of the road, it's going to seem way cheaper in comparison, simply like by dint of contrast. Again, to reiterate, and we'll talk about this more in reciprocation, it's not enough to simply just show two things that are different. You have to order them based on how you want the person to perceive the value of the second thing that you show. It is more profitable for salespeople to present an expensive item first, presenting an inexpensive product first and allowing and following it with an expensive one makes the expensive item seem more costly. My partner, who is actually the impetus for this entire book club, she is uh, studying marketing right now. She wanted to drill into this book and learn more about it that she's not learning in school. And so that was why this whole book club came about. Those are the big takeaways from uh, the first chapter. There was also a small like insert section on like, like social proof and in particular online reviews. It showed you a few different ways to like detect fake reviews. If you have the book, just go read that. With chapter two, what is reciprocation? This is the first of the levers of influence that Caldini is going to talk about. And in two weeks time, we'll talk about the next two, but this is the first one. What is reciprocation? The rule of reciprocation says that we should try to repay what another person has provided us. By virtue of the reciprocity rule, we are obligated to the future repayment of favors, gifts, invitations, friendly actions, and the like. So if you've ever seen a sales message that says something like, hey, you are invited to pay money. Hey, here's a free gift that comes with a purchase. You understand now the principle that's underlying those sales techniques and tactics. That's what's going on under the hood. Reciprocity is probably one of the more powerful of the levers of influence that Caldini states. And he sort of summarizes why in these passages. I don't know if I agree with all this 100%, but I'm also very skeptical of like evolutionary psychology and this notion of like, well, obviously like this set of human behaviors that I notice around me are, have been universal since the dawn of time because of the way that it, you know, could clearly benefit humanity. I, like anybody who says that, I'm just like, yeah, like reciprocity is not a gene. That's not baked in, but that's my opinion. Caldini says that the social pressure surrounding gift giving process, there's an obligation to give, an obligation to receive, and an obligation to repay. And that's actually Caldini quoting another sociologist. To explain why reciprocation actually works in society and with individual people. He says human societies derive a significant competitive advantage from the reciprocity rule and consequently make sure their members are trained to comply with it. This is another example of, and you'll see this a lot in pop psychology books and especially books on, on like copywriting, marketing, human behavior, things like that, where he'll just say something that sounds really true and like sounds like, oh yeah, like that makes sense. But if you like really look at it closely, all you need to do is go, does it? Does human society de 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 derive a significant competitive advantage from the reciprocity rule? And you could sort of talk yourself into like, yes, yes, it does. But at the same time, it's still like trying to provide a reason behind something that is inherently random, 
that is evolution. Yeah, if you don't follow social rules, you're weird and rejected. The philosopher Aldo Leopold once said that the thing that makes ethics work is social reprobation. But again, that's not something that was there when we were monkeys that developed some other way. It might not be baked in. We just don't know. And I don't know if we can know, but that doesn't matter because here we are wondering why. There is a general distaste for those who take and make no effort to give in return. We will often go to great lengths to avoid being considered a freeloader. That's his reason. The reason he says is behind reciprocation and why it works, that societies derive some sort of benefit from this being coded and hardwired into human brains. And obviously, if you are a marketer, you can use that same lever of influence to get better results with your marketing. Here's how reciprocation works. That was why reciprocation, why he says reciprocation works. Here's how reciprocation works. One important reason concerns the clearly unpleasant character of the feeling of indebtedness. Again, this is relying on the notion that the people you're speaking to are not sociopaths. Most of us find it highly disagreeable to be in a state of obligation. It weighs heavily on us and demands to be removed because reciprocal arrangements are so vital in human social systems, we have been conditioned to feel uncomfortable when beholden. Do we? Is it? But at the same time, like enough evidence seems to point to this being the case, at least in some circumstances and some contexts. And I certainly don't know if this holds true for every culture throughout human history. So if we were to ignore the need to return another's initial favor, we would stop one reciprocal sequence dead and make it less likely that our benefactor would do such favors in the future. Neither event is in the best interest of society. Consequently, we are trained from childhood to chafe emotionally under the saddle of obligation. So that's Caldini's argument for how this is working. If we sort of think about this, we can extrapolate a lot of information that Caldini sort of pulls out. And it explains, if we take this at face value, it explains a lot about human society and the notion that if you scratch my back, I will scratch yours. You know, we even have expressions for these sorts of things. We can drive a lot of strategies and a lot of tactics using reciprocation. And over the course of the book, there are a lot of takeaways Caldini is going to give that you should keep in mind as a marketer as a copywriter, as a writer, because those strategies, those tactics, those are what exists. And obviously, if you want to innovate, you have to take the principle of reciprocation and then do something else that still operates on the same lever of influence. One of the big takeaways that he sort of launches off with in this chapter is the notion that people tend to be programmed, like when you do a favor for somebody and they say, thank you, people tend to be, they tend to downplay it. They say like, no big deal, oh, no worries, like not a problem, things like that. And so one of the big takeaways for Caldini is like, if you wanna change your social standing, if you wanna change your social behavior, if you want to improve your interactions with people, when somebody says, thank you, don't say things like, oh, no big deal. Don't downplay yourself or your own behaviors or actions. You give your actions more merit and more worth when you say something like, well, I'm sure if our positions were reversed, I'm sure you'd do the same for me. One of the things that I think is going on here is that Caldini is saying that, oh, this is reciprocity at work. But I think a lot of what he says in the chapter on reciprocity, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of this also sort of hinges on something that he doesn't really talk about, which is that humans tend to want to perceive themselves as the good guy in their own story. They want to perceive themselves as being generous, as being altruistic. People tend to want to appear good, maybe not be good, but appear good. One of the things that's going on here perhaps might not be the lever of reciprocity, that notion of give and get. It might be that you're feeding into people's notions about themselves. Groups also resonate with reciprocity. And the psychology of reciprocation applies to big groups as well. And in fact, whole societies can feel obligations and personal debts. Uh, one of the examples that uh, Caldini gives is like, why did Ethiopia, a starving country in the 80s, give 
$5,000 in foreign aid to Mexico after a hurricane. And the explanation that Caldini and the journalist provides is that, oh, well, Mexico helped Ethiopia in the 30s. That is the sort of like, oh, yeah, well, okay, like hand wash, like, okay, we have an explanation. There it is. There's also a obverse to that coin. Yes, groups can feel an obligation to other groups and individuals, but here's the thing. Groups can also feel, mm, how should I say, very spiteful towards groups that they perceive as having harmed them in the past. And if we are harmed by an individual from another group that, we, and we cannot harm that person in return, we are more likely to exact revenge on another person in that group. And in one sentence, Caldini says, oh, it, yeah, that, that's, that's racism. That's, that's the underlying principle of racism. Here, we're going to start talking about the big takeaways from marketers. Um, and there's going to be several from chapter one that I want you to keep in mind. If you've ever received a coupon for 40% off just because you're an awesome guy, that's a free gift. If you've ever received a free gift card for a free latte you know, to Starbucks, that is going to influence your behavior in some way. Business operators have found that after accepting a gift, customers are willing to purchase products and agree to requests that they would have otherwise declined. An important thing that he brings up in this chapter that I don't think he spends much time on that I want you to keep in mind is the fact that there's a, a like contrast and order of operations here. They did a study at a McDonald's. Free gift when people entered tended to spend more, but, but, People who had bought something and then were leaving who received a free gift, and they ended up not spending that much money on McDonald's in the future. And so there's a pre-purchase necessity to this gift giving that needs to happen. That's why you see so many webinars that open up with like, I have a free gift for you. It's available at the end of this thing. And I'm sorry to say, but at the end of this, I do not have a free gift for you. They work best when you give them upfront without the expectation of additional sales. Another takeaway, the free sample. This is an offshoot of the free gift. And this is the part of the chapter where Caldini in particular like pointed out his own, I'm not gonna say hypocrisy, but the sort of like conflicted nature where he was talking about his website that offered a free chapter of persuasion in an effort to boost sales. Here's what he says about it. As a marketing technique, the free sample has a long and effective history. In most instances, a small amount of the relevant product is given to potential customers to see if they like it. Certainly, this is a legitimate desire of the manufacturer to expose the public to the qualities of the product. The beauty of the free sample, however, is that it is also a gift and as such can engage the reciprocity. Here's another takeaway from chapter two, personalization. When it comes to free gifts or free samples, there is a marked improvement in response when you personalize the message. I've actually had extensive conversations uh, with people about this on the copywriting discord I'm a part of, which is that you're, if you're trying to cold email people or cold call people, the first few lines of your message should be relatively personalized. There was a campaign. It was a direct response campaign. And what they did was they sent a handwritten message thanking people for their support and asking for additional support. I think it was for a charity. That act of like, pers like handwriting and personalizing a message to somebody is just so uncommon nowadays. This thing that used to be very common now actually serves as a lever of influence because of the effort that's involved in personalizing a message to somebody in particular. That's why like if you're an email copywriter opening with like, hey, did you see this comma first name massively boosts opens and like actually tailoring the email message to either to their experience, what they've done, what they've seen, who they are using their first name rather than like dear reader or dear friend, that's personalization at work. That's why it improves your actual email marketing results. Another takeaway is concession. And this is a big one. He actually devotes a lot of time to exploring various facets of concession. One of the big things that you want to take away from this is I think that there's an attitude in marketing and negotiating that I'm, I'm going to call it the never split the difference technique, which is to just be an uncompromising asshole. Of course, it's more nuanced than that. But like one of the things that Caldini is arguing is that you don't want to be an uncompromising asshole when it comes to sales. You want to concede a little bit. More important than conceding something is 
showing yourself, appearing as having conceded something for the sake of this relationship, of this interaction. And that's an important distinction there. There's a difference between like actually conceding on a point and like in a sale proposition versus appearing to have conceded a point. So to quote Caldini, the general rule of reciprocation says that a person who acts in a certain way toward us is entitled to a similar return action. We have already seen that one consequence of the rule is an obligation to repay favors. Another consequence is an obligation to make a concession to someone who has made a concession to us. When you as a salesperson or as a writer make it seem like you are conceding on points and being fair and balanced and that you're actually willing to hear the other side and incorporate that information, the person listening to you tends to feel more responsible to listen to you and more satisfied with what you're saying, even if it's gobbledygook. That's an important thing to keep in mind, especially if you're in a sales context too, that if you want to have better customers, have more qualified customers, one thing that you can do is make it seem like you're conceding to them something, like the actual act of the sale is in somehow sacrificial. One particular takeaway that Caldini provides is an offshoot of concession, which is the rejection then re retreat type of concession. What that is and how he describes it in the book is if you present something that's absurd and the person says that's absurd and then you present another thing that's less absurd it's going to seem by dint of the contrast quote unquote principle that that next thing is obviously totally rational and totally reasonable if you show somebody something and it's very high priced and then you say, oh, you're right. This is very high price. You don't, you don't need to buy this. Let me go out on a limb here for you and show you something that's a little bit cheaper. Well, then you've engaged the trigger of reciprocation. And he shows that there are examples from real estate. He shows examples from sales. He shows examples from a, a number of different fields. You know, one way to increase the chances, I'm quoting here, that I will comply is first to make a larger request of me one that I will most likely turn down, then after I have refused, you make the smaller request that you were really interested in all along. You can use this in any sort of circumstance. You can even use this with children. Like say you want them to eat strawberries and they don't want to eat the strawberries and you know that they're not going to want to eat the strawberries. What you do is say like, hey, do you want to eat a bunch of Brussels sprouts? The kid will say no and say like, okay, then you can have, you can have strawberries instead. And the kid is more likely going to respond positively to this. It all comes down to that order of operations of perception in the philosophical discussions of phenomenology. There's a subgroup called uh, hermeneutics, which is how we perceive writing and text. You get different interpretations of a situation depending upon the simple order of two of the same thing. That's what's at stake here. That's what's going on here. And that's something you want to keep in mind in your writing and in interpersonal interactions. Another important study that he brings up, again, sort of glosses over, is the fact that like that first request, the request that you don't really care about getting the person to consent to, it can't be so extreme that it feels wholly unreasonable. Like if it's just like, like total BS, the person's going to just shut down and be like, no, to everything that you have to say. And you don't want that. The thing that you are retreating on and then offering next has to be conducive with the person's desires. And this is true of everything that we're talking about here in terms of reciprocity. The initial gift has to be somewhat related to the ultimate result that you're trying to get the person to do. This works even if the person is familiar with the technique. It's kind of like how the placebo effect works, even if people are aware of the placebo effect. Like these sorts of techniques in particular work, even if it's been done to somebody before. And they're like, oh, that's what's going on. Well, guess what? It's going to work again. And in fact, might even work better on the group that experienced it before. As long as we perceive and define the action as a compliance device instead of a favor, the giver no longer has the reciprocation rule as an ally. The rule says that favors are to be met with favors. It does not require that tricks be met with favors. That's an important thing to keep in mind as a marketer. In a sales situation, you actually have to give sincerely. You can't just be like, oh, man, I'm going to employ this free gift tactic in order to like boost my conversions and sales. No, like every now and again, you actually have to mean it. <laughs> you have to mean what you say. Sorry, 
The second that something reveals itself as being exploitative or as being a compliance device, well, that's, that's when you say like, okay, I'm just gonna take what you're giving me and give nothing in return. You have to be aware that people are aware of these particular tactics. And that's it. That was a, a summary breakdown of the major takeaways of chapters one and two of Robert Caldini's influence. Hi. Oh, hey. That is my wife and that's my baby. And that's she, Rod. She's doing First of all, you're saying I was the baby. I was like, oh. <laughs> uh, you, you can be my baby too if you want. I have to ask, what did you guys think of the first two chapters of Caldini's influence? It's some good food for thought, particularly the, the door in the face technique he was talking about. The I forgot what he calls it, the something then retreat. Um, because I think there are a lot of implications for you know how we present offers to people i found the book very insightful like i've used many of these principles one thing that i like do think of when whenever i read this kind of stuff is like yes you could artificially create this right like you could artificially create reciprocity but i think like it's much better to just do it sincerely because like consistency matters as well like if you're not consistent in you know your your, your giving right? Like if it's only as a compliance device and only to get something back, people are not going to like want, want to do business with you, right? But if you can be sincere and if you, be, if you can be consistent, you might as well not do it artificially. I really enjoyed it. I would say the most surprising thing to me um, when I read uh, was the oh. scenario that he talked about, about the turquoise and doubling the price. The employee made that mistake and she was sitting on that inventory and it just disappeared. I would have never thought that something as simple as just inflating the price would have more of an impact. Because for me, I've always been the kind of shopper that looks for the bargain by low so high. Like I get a thrill out of that, but there are so many people that if you fall into that market, it's really easy to have that bias. I think there's a reason why he launched off with that particular anecdote because it's so like counterintuitive. Rising. I think that's a good um, thing to keep in mind for writing as well. If you're writing a sale piece of sales copy, a book, uh, some sort of piece of content, like launch off with a really surprising example that illustrates what you're trying to say that completely blows your mind and would, of course, blow the mind of anybody who's listening. Uh, oh, hi. Give me that baby. What? <laughs> hi. How did that happen, y'all? So I would definitely say one of the big techniques that I used a lot that I found was really successful was getting a client to buy a product by showing them the more expensive product first and then showing them a product that was cheaper. So I wouldn't necessarily go, hey, here's this product. Uh, you need this product and then immediately go to the cheaper product if they had themselves verbalized hey that's a little bit out of my price range then I go okay well how about this one or here's the travel size version depending on their budget and also sometimes just offer things for free like I would curl their hair if I had an extra 15 minutes and I wouldn't charge them and that got me a really high rate of return and I would tell them like hey I'm just going to do this for you because I have the free time so you know, so that idea of, of gifting a service and a lot of times because of that, they would buy retail. I think an important thing about what Kaylee was just saying is that she would give the free thing, but then add that because I have free time mm -hmm. because of this. And it really like it's that because that triggers people to recognize what you're doing as a concession. One of the things that occurred to me is that like, when you let's use the Boy Scout example, where first you're going to try to sell someone on something for $5, and then you're like, okay, fine, here's this $1 offer. Kildini notes that like people feel more satisfied, more engaged with the offers when you start with a concession. And I feel like one of the reasons is that when you are listening to someone acquiesce and they give you the lower offer and you get to say yes to that second offer you feel like you're the person who's actually receiving com compliance, even though you're the person complying with them. Um, if you like this, and you like this kind of content, you like the way that Rod, Luke, and I speak about copy and marketing, we do have a Monday morning show called Copy That. It's going to be on twitch.tv at the Copy That Show. And then we edit them and put them up on our YouTube, which is youtube.com slash copy that. If you like our stuff, 
yeah, you know, <laughs> do your thing. You know, I'm not trying to establish a reciprocal arrangement here. I'm hoping that you have made a rational choice that we are intelligent, lovely, handsome people that especially this baby, maybe more baby cameos. If you join us on the copy that show, <laughs> you'll get more baby. If you see the copy that show, <laughs> join us on the copy that show tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on twitch.tv slash the copy that show. Well, when Noah gets this, I'm sure he can <laughs> like use that as like a trailer for like future, <laughs> like or like something to end the episode on. <laughs> anyway, guys, have a lovely Sunday. Thank you so much for joining. I hope to see you all in two weeks time. And I hope to see more of you in the future. <laughs>